operating in and then dive to um, some on-farm actions that we can take to manage and reduce their emissions. There we go. Uh, could we have Roger, Roger, could you mute please? Just coming. Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, yeah, as I said, I'm just gonna go through some um, context, context globally where we set um, the local context in New Zealand and um, some reflections because I was talking to Annette um, earlier today about who would be on this call. Um, and funny story, I was also a climate activist previously. Um, so over my time working in this kind of space, um, I've come to some different conclusions than what I kind of started out with. So I wanted to um, share this with you all. Um, so globally, um, agricultural forestry land use is actually um, a potentially small proportion of total emissions in the world. Energy and specifically um, the use of fossil fuels in either um, uh, power production or transport is the major source. Um, and then there's a few different disagreements about um, if it's 20% or 25% or 15% in terms of um, total emissions coming from the agricultural, forestry, and land use sectors. Um, but it is just good to keep that context when we're thinking about New Zealand. So bringing that down, um, if the ping pong ball here on your right is 1% of global emissions, um, then New Zealand's total emissions is about the size of a marble. And of that marble, about half of our emissions come from the agricultural sector. So um, in this graph, you have um, the green, which highlights emissions from agricultural production. Um, and in the blue, you have um, other emissions, um, mostly carbon dioxide from energy and transport. Um, when we talk about agricultural emissions, um, it's really important to make a distinction between short-lived and long-lived gases. Um, and breaking this down even further, um, about half of the total agricultural emissions um, come from the dairy industry. And then about um, like, yeah, a third or a bit more come from the sheep and beef sector. And then there's others, including fertilizer production, lime use, um, and deer. So in the sheep and beef context, um, since 1990, our sector has actually decreased emissions by 30%. Um, which is a pretty big number actually. Um, and in addition to that, um, we have the second largest holding of native forest and biodiversity after the Crown Estate. Um, we have provided estimates of how much um, carbon is stored on uh, sheep and beef land nationally. Um, and depending on what report you look at and what assumptions you make, um, we're currently offsetting 33 to 130% of our total emissions. So um, our vision as an industry is to make sure that we have a mosaic of landscapes that with vegetation that's fully integrated within a farm system. Um, and one of the things I'm sure you guys are conscious of right now is um, some challenges that are in the carbon forestry and farming space uh, where we're seeing whole land use conversions to pines um, or other exotics um, that may not necessarily be managed um, going forward. So taking this down to a farm level, um, there's a number of sources of emissions um, and cycling of emissions within a biological farm system. Um, the main thing is actually methane. So 80% of the emissions, um, at least from a sheep and beef context, um, come from methane emissions, and that's from cows burping, not farting. Um, and then we also have nitrous oxide emissions um, coming from um, uh, it going into the atmosphere from um, urine patches mostly. And then um, as kind of Sean and Olivia have talked about, um, we also have some carbon potentially stored in on-farm vegetation. But the challenge, however, is that um, if those trees fall over or are harvested um, as part of their decay, and use in products, um, that carbon is then released back into the atmosphere. 
So as I mentioned before, um, it's really important to make a distinction between short-lived and long-lived gases. So um, the way that I describe it um, is that a short-lived gas like methane um, goes in, up into the atmosphere, it has a really grand party, it's kind of like um, at a rave essentially, and it just goes really hard, gets really excited, and then it kind of exhausts itself um, and um, disintegrates essentially. Um, but while it's up there, it's creating a lot of warming. Um, the carbon dioxide, on the other hand, will go up, and I think of it as um, two slow dancers, right? So they can just continue to dance and dance and dance and dance and dance forever and ever. Um, and for every carbon dioxide atom that goes up now, um, it can stay there in the atmosphere for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, so it's a really important distinction to make between um, what can be stock gases, which are long-lived emissions such as carbon dioxide, and flow gases, which are short-lived emissions like methane, where um, depending on the rate of increase into the atmosphere, you'll have a very different impact on warming. Um, and this distinction between emissions and warming is something that um, the IPCC has uh, strongly recommended that countries take into account um, as part of their uh, obligations under the Paris Agreement. So um, when we take that into a policy context, um, New Zealand put forward the Climate Change Response Act back in 2002. Um, that was amended in, in 2019 um, so that we have uh, short-lived and long-lived greenhouse gas targets and legislation. Um, these targets are something for the government of the day to be, to be achieving. Um, there is an independent climate change commission who's been set up to kind of keep track of how the government is progressing on those. Um, and there's also the legislative backbone for um, the functioning of the emissions trading scheme. Um, in terms of what this means for the sheep and beef sector, um, based on the settings in the emissions trading scheme right now and the price of carbon, um, there's a huge incentive for um, people to be participating in the emissions trading scheme um, from a, a financial perspective. Um, and in addition to that, um, there's been pressure from numerous parties to quote, put ag in the emissions trading scheme um, because to date, uh, the emissions associated with biological ruminant production, i.e. cows burping, um, have not faced a price in the emissions trading scheme. So um, at that time in 2019, um, everybody said, right, put ag in ETS. And actually when you dig into it, um, as a policy approach, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so instead, um, the industry uh, gathered together along with uh, government partners um, to design an alternative. So that alternative, um, has a number of key milestones and components. Um, and the whole idea is to make sure that we can design a practical and cost-effective system with farmers and farming um, bodies, not have a system imposed upon them. Um, and to bring farmers on the journey of this process because um, it's actually pretty hard to manage this stuff. So in terms of um, the milestones and our progress to date, um, we have achieved the goals for the end of last year, which was to have um, guidance put out for how to include the management of greenhouse gases in uh, farm plans. Um, the other goal was to have 25% uh, of farmers know their numbers by the end of last year. And another goal to have 25% of farmers have a plan to manage their emissions. So we didn't quite meet the 25% of having a plan to manage emissions. Um, but actually we far exceeded the uh, pr proportion of farmers who know their numbers, um, where we had about 60% of the total um, stock units in the country um, whose landowners knew their numbers, right? So that's pretty great. So, but the end of this year, and this will be the challenging part, 100% um, of farmers are expected to know their numbers. And I'm just looking that <laughs> they're farmers, not famers. Um, and so that's something that we need to work through. And by the end of 2025, 100% of farmers have a plan to manage their greenhouse gas emissions. So those are, um, this farm planning and emissions reporting system is connected but separate 
um, to this emissions pricing proposal that actually just went up um, last week. So um, that provided advice to the government about um, what the Haywaki Economa Partnership um, thinks could work on farm, both from an emissions reduction perspective as well as a farm implementation perspective. Um, the government will be making um, consultation rather than decisions, sorry, in September and then final decisions in December this year. So it's a pretty quick turnaround in terms of um, what we're seeing um, on the ground. Their plan is to have a pilot of whatever we land on in 2024 with the pricing system in place by 2025. So all of that is this policy context. Um, and the idea is that if you put a price on emissions, um, farmers will take it into account. Um, and as a result, they'll try to reduce their emissions. Now, within a sheep and beef context, um, there actually aren't that many opportunities for farmers to be reducing their emissions right now. Um, there are some really good things that people can do, which um, focuses around uh, effectively increasing the efficiency of the farm business. Um, potentially bringing in low emissions feeds or um, reducing the use of nitrogen fertilizers. Um, but these are things that kind of cut on the margin um, rather than make significant em emissions reductions. Um, some things that we do have, have in the pipeline are uh, genetics. So right now we have some um, very, uh, <laughs> um, very, experienced rams um, who are very excited to get on paddocks, who, um, whose progeny actually can create, create low emissions lambs um, and so forth. So depending on kind of how fast you roll that out, um, you can get anywhere between a, between a 2 to 20 percent emissions reduction. Um, so that's something that we're definitely planning for um, in the short term. And then there's other um, plans, including for a vaccine or for um, kind of a probiotic pill that we could feed um, sheep and cattle to manage um, the methane um, activity occurring in their stomach and rumen. So taking a step back a bit um, from this conversation, um, one of the things that our farmers are really conscious about is that this is um, their farm system, right? So, um, one of the things here is that um, although farmers can take action within their um, farm kind of gate, um, it's actually the full farm food system that we need to be considering when we think about emissions um, and demand and value. So um, one of the things that Beef and Lamb New Zealand has been doing for the last couple of years, um, and more than that actually, is working really hard to make sure that we're adding value to the products that we supply to market. Um, so this includes um, work to break down carcasses into um, different pieces of product and, and marketing those piece, those products specifically to different consumers. Um, the, oop, I think I missed it actually. I did have a slide here about Taste Pure Nature, um, which is a uh, branding effort that we've had going since 2019 that has provided dividends really. Um, that is branding both in China and the United States to uh, what we're calling conscious foodies. Uh, so there are people who um, are willing to pay a bit more for um, having confidence in the uh, value of the product provided um, and the assurances that um, farmers are taking every effort that they can um, to reduce their environmental footprint. And um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Silver Fern Farms launched a carbon neutral beef product in the United States and, and was actually accompanied by Jacinda Ardern. So, um, as I mentioned before, um, I've been in the space as a person not from a farming background nor from New Zealand <laughs> um, for about 10 years now. And um, over that time, there's been a changing conversation, really, about agricultural emissions in New Zealand um, and the role that they play writ large. So one of the key, there's a few key things that I really um, want to highlight to you all, um, and I can give resources to kind of help you guys dig deeper if you would like on these. Um, the first things to remember is that biological emissions um, from kind of land use sectors in particular are quite different from fossil fuel emissions. Um, 
And the Parliamentary Commission for the Environment actually released a report a few years ago that highlighted this difference really well. Um, and it means that because of their differences, we have choices about if we want to manage them differently. Um, on top of this, um, short-lived greenhouse gases have a very different impact than long-lived gases, um, especially those from fossil fuel. And so it's really important um, that countries kind of take the lead that New Zealand has taken of dividing targets for um, short-lived versus long-lived greenhouse gases and working really hard in a domestic context to make sure that you have policies that are uh, specifically targeted to these kinds of greenhouse gases and treat them differently because of the way that they act differently in the atmosphere. Um, the other thing is that farmers always want to do the right thing, um, but the right thing is really context dependent, right? So farmers are asking for solutions. They want to make this happen. Um, but right now, um, as I describe it <laughs> with a horrible joke, um, there are no silver bullets other than literally silver bullets right now. Um, so the best thing to do is just to continue to improve the efficiency of a farm system. Um, and until we have some um, tried and true and tested um, technologies, um, it will be really, really hard for um, producers to be reducing their emissions substantially. Um, the last thing here is that um, in a economics sense, um, the assumption is that a price on emissions will automatically reduce emissions. Um, but actually what we found is that um, in emissions trading scheme context, that necessarily hasn't been the case. Um, we've had the emissions trading scheme in place since 2008. Our emissions have not gone down since 2008. Um, and on top of that, um, when you put that into an agricultural context, um, the modeling that we've done as part of the Haywaki Kino Partnership shows that the majority of emissions reductions as a result of the program are not necessarily from the price charge but rather um, the incentives provided to farmers to uptake um, potential technologies that then reduce emissions. So it's really important to kind of question the assumptions that we make about um, what is right and wrong and good action in this space. So what next, right? Um, there's a whole lot of questions that we as a country need to be asking ourselves about um, what we want to be doing to transition to a low emissions economy and to resilient landscapes in the face of climate change. Um, and with that, um, our vision at least as Beefland New Zealand is to have truly integrated vegetation within farm systems um, and making sure that the choices we make today can provide resilience for um, stewards of the future. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and take any questions. Excellent, thank you Madeline. So has anybody got any questions? I, um, feel free, there is one there. Is it from Roy, perhaps? Yeah. Um, so I see a question from Joe saying, what is Beef and Lamb doing to support farmers in the water food distribution systems um, to reduce fossil fuel use? Um, so we as Beef and Lamb New Zealand are not necessarily doing much, but we're supporting our meat processors to take additional action within their meat processing plants um, to reduce the use of coal, for example, um, that they have. So um, in meat processing plants, depending on the way that energy is used, um, there is coal usage, um, especially in some of the Fonterra plants. Um, and so those processors are working really hard to transition away from the use of fossil fuels. Um, and there's water questions as part of the emissions reduction plan about how we can ensure that our trucking fleet um, is as efficient and low emissions as possible um, across the country, not just for um, food production systems within New Zealand. Um, with all of that said, um, the absolute majority of emissions, anywhere between 80 to 90 percent um, of emissions from a, um, a kind of kg of meat that you consume, um, is actually coming from uh, the emissions associated with the burping and just biological functioning of the animal rather than the um, transport of that product to market um, or its uh, transport to your home or in the waste system and its um, emissions released as part of that process. And of course we can all be very proud of the fact that um, New Zealand meat has um, the lowest emissions in the world. Um, even yeah, yeah. right across the world. So that says something 
pretty amazingly about how our farmers farm out outdoors and and efficiently. Um, yeah. So Roy, you have a question. Uh, just I see Roger put up his finger, but he has the microphone turned off. Yeah, and Roy, you'll have to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question, and then we'll go to um, Roger. Uh, oh, Roger wants to know what are the benefits of feeding fodder on methane? Um, Does that? Uh, that, um, is from Madeline, is a, an article I read some years ago, a research article from South Africa, where they had figured out that methane emissions from stock was reduced by the feeding of acacia fodder to, to um, cattle. And I wondered if the New Zealand or the, that global consortium that's looking at those things had considered that those sorts of approaches of feeding different, uh, more shrubby, woody vegetation to, to stock to reduce um, methane emissions. Yeah, most definitely. So um, there are a lot of really smart people, way smarter than myself, who have been working on this since I was born, really. Um, who have been working their entire professional lives to find alternative forages for animals, both cattle and sheep, um, that can help reduce their methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions. The challenge is that um, although we do have some products, including fodder beet, for example, that may be able to support emissions reductions from a methane perspective, um, the proportion of their diet could potentially be quite high um, and so it's actually quite hard to implement on a hill country farming system, for example. Um, and uh, depending on the kind of amount of fodder in their diet, um, you could be seeing impacts on the production capability of that animal um, because they're spending more time and energy digesting their food than they are um, using it to grow their meat or produce milk. So there's always this trade off here um, between what we're feeding our animals and what products we're looking from them. Um, so one of the key goals from the, um, the many different research groups and organizations that are working on this globally is to find a, uh, a food supplement or a fodder supplement that can be added into the animal's existing diet systems, um, preferably pasture-based in a New Zealand context, um, that can support emissions reductions without necessarily um, greatly impacting the productive potential of that animal. Thank you. Okay, um, Joanna. Thank you. And then Barbara, and then we'll go to our breakout sessions and we can discuss this more. Okay, I, I wanna thank Madeline for, for a clear and frank um, presentation, which I actually found a bit depressing um, because I, I, what, I, what I heard in summary was we, we can hope for some emission reductions from greater efficiencies and from genetics in, in, in the short term, like immediately. Um, but, but for the rest, it depends on technologies that have decades and decades of research behind them, but haven't borne fruit yet, um, which, which isn't very hopeful in terms of, of reducing emissions from this sector. Um, so I, in, I appreciated your frankness in that area and in, invite your comment on my um, fairly depressed look at, yeah. at what, what we might hope for from the sector. Yeah, so um, it is one of those things where um, science cannot necessarily solve all of our problems, even if we want it to. Um, so there is a need to acknowledge that change will need, need to occur potentially before we have the technological solutions that we're mm -hmm. seeking and providing funding for. So um, part of the Haywaki Kanoa recommendation system is to provide a backbone for whatever outcome we see, right? So if we, if we, see, a, if we see a future in five to 10 years time where we have lots of technologies, the system can work then. And if we have a system where we don't actually have a lot of technologies on hand, then the system can also work in that case. So we're trying to be flexible with whatever is coming at us. Um, 
One of the key things to remember though, is that um, because methane, which is 80% of the emissions from a um, agricultural system um, is a short lived gas, um, in order to uh, prevent any further warming, you don't necessarily need to reduce emissions. Rather, you just need to keep emissions stable. And that's that difference between stock and flow gases. So in some of those reflections, um, kind of thinking about what that means when you trickle down some of those high level ideas into what that means in practice, um, it could mean that um, depending on the choices that we make, um, New Zealand could continue to keep its current productive capacity and still create the same emissions, um, but actually have um, no additional warming impact as part of the goal towards 1.5 degree warming or no more than two degree warming under the Paris Agreement. Um, so one of the key um, conversations that we as Beef and Lamb New Zealand are encouraging others to, to think about right now um, is a key distinction to be made between um, reducing emissions versus reducing or managing warming. Um, and those, it's a quite different concept and way of framing it, um, but it's really important for our sector and our systems um, because of the biological nature, nature of our emissions and because many of our emissions um, have that uh, flow characteristic or short-lived characteristic. No improvement is depressing, but I'll, I'll pass. <laughs> go right, we have Barbara as the last question and then you're miraculously going to go into a um, breakout group and any ongoing questions um, or any projects that you think that this carbon, what you've heard today might be useful and what support you might need, that's going to be the topic of conversation so that um, I've got some take home things to work on. But yeah, Barbara, last question. Thanks, Annette. Madeline, my question sort of builds on the previous one to some extent. I take your point about um, just sustaining methane being okay, but actually, if we think New Zealand Inc, reducing methane gives us a very rapid way of having an impact on the warming effect. So getting methane down has some immediate benefits to all of us. Mm -hmm. But my original question was about what incentives are there to reduce the absolute number of sheep and beef, particularly the beef, I guess, because they're bigger animals and put out more methane, because all these other technical things seem to be gains around the margins, whereas actually the number of cows is the problem. And I know dairy is a major contribution to that, but so is the sheep and beef sector. So what other strategies do you think could actually help farmers reduce the absolute number of cows? And I know there's work to reduce the, to increase the efficiency of cows, but but that um, may just mean that I can have better production. It doesn't mean I necessarily have to reduce the number of cows on my place. So how do we, how do we help farmers think about how they could reduce the absolute number of burping animals? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, and I guess, so, so my background is environmental sociology um, and I studied kind of farmer identity and the history of New Zealand farming and the stories that we tell ourselves about what is good farming in New Zealand. Um, and one of those key stories is production, right? And really oriented strongly towards production. So asking farmers to reduce their production as part of an emissions management system um, is almost an existential threat to what it means to be a good farmer in the country. And, and so we're really, really careful about the wording and articulation that we use when we talk about these things. And um, secondly, um, there is always opportunity for um, systems to become more efficient. Um, and as you say, sometimes that efficiency can mean um, getting more from the same amount of animals, but it can also mean getting more from less animals. And when we talk about emissions efficiency, that's partially what we're thinking about. Um, so Dairy New Zealand actually has some really good research that they've done on their research farm called Owl Farm, where they were able to um, reduce the total number of cows that were milking on the platform, um, but also um, reduce their emissions, increase their production, um, and actually get better profits. So there's plenty of opportunity for people to be doing that within their system. And the, the door to open that is the door towards efficiency. Um, and there's a difference between business efficiency um, and kind of product efficiency. So 
how many kilograms of methane are being emitted per kilogram of product as compared to um, the amount of emissions occurring per hectare per product. So it's all about the metrics that you use really. Um, hopefully that's answered the question a bit. Sort of. Um, <laughs> I think we need something more radical because the contribution is, we could make a really fast